Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Marie Giblin. I'm a partner at Hinshaw and Culbertson, I'm along with my partner, Laura Knittel. And we're going to be talking today about cybersecurity, cyber issues, and privacy issues for school districts. Um, now, just a little bit of a primer, we could spend two weeks just on this topic talking about it alone, but we only have an hour a day. So the goal is to issue some high level notes for you, get you thinking about ways to start talking about data and cybersecurity and give you information on the laws. Now the program today is meant to be general enough for school districts that are beyond the Illinois school district system, but we are gonna be talking about Illinois laws specifically today as well too. And with that, I'll, I'll turn over to Laura. Hi everybody, it's really nice to be here today and thank you for taking time out of your surely busy schedules with everything going on. Um, I've been practicing school law for about nine years now. I, I represent Illinois school districts primarily. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I have been pushing and wanting for a long time to have an expert in data privacy and security. And now Henshaw has one. And I, when Anne-Marie first started at the firm, I was like, I've got to get you on board. We've got to work on school district issues because it's so important. And um, I want to help clients really access this resource and make sure that every that your networks are secure and that we have things in place to to protect you so i'm really excited to to see you guys today and to meet some some new faces even though i can't see you i know you're there um and and we'll get going today so thanks for joining great so i'm going to just dive right in and start sharing my screen um because we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time to cover it in so um i'm going to just mention as well too Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Let me go back. So this is the presentation. So obviously we're going to start. We're going to talk about cyber and privacy law for school districts. Um, here's a little bit of a roadmap for our discussion today. And I do want to mention that a great organization called K-12, which is a nonprofit ISAC, which is an information sharing group that has been created specifically for K-12 through school districts, is having another presentation today. Great timing um, at 2 p.m. Eastern that we will be posting a link to in the chat. Their presentation will be more technical and actually talking about cybersecurity controls beyond the law. Today, Laura and I really want to focus on the legal obligations and how to start thinking about it from a legal and data governance perspective. So first, we're going to define the risk for you. Then we're going to start talking about those data governance and cybersecurity planning issues that you should start be thinking about and hopefully get to a point of implementation. Then we're going to dial into the federal laws and then down, down, dial down more into the Illinois state laws. So let's dive in. Um, and I have to say that this is an issue near and dear to my heart as well. As a mom, having children in a school district, in a public school district, and just being concerned about this, especially from a legal perspective. So this slide looks really intimidating, but don't let it be. Um, it's really meant to talk to you about some of the risks that school districts can face. So now I'm going to go through each one of these. These are really common cyber scams that we see happening over and over again to businesses, school districts, people, all types of entities, government entities as well too. Now in the cyber industry, school districts can be considered a soft target for cyber criminals. And what does that mean? It means that school districts are likely to have less stringent cybersecurity controls and procedures, thereby making it easier to employ cyber crimes against them. Now, just because you're a soft target, that does not mean that schools do not have valuable information to steal. In fact, because schools are managing and caring for some of the most vulnerable members of our society, our children, their information that you collect and maintain can be some of the most valuable information to steal. And why is that? Several reasons. First, children should have clean criminal records. Despite what my four-year-old has done to several <laughs> of my personal items, <laughs> he is a clean criminal uh, person. No criminal record, no issues. He also has identifying information like social security numbers and maybe a passport uh, number, and there's no credit report. So you have a clean identity to steal from a child who has no use for it at this point and will not know that it's been stolen or compromised until they're very much older, maybe 18 going for their first FAFSA form or opening their first credit card. That gives the criminal several years to do whatever they want with this information. Now, what would they want to do with it? It means that bad actors can steal their identity, open credit cards, do financial crime. They can also try to sell it. There's people trying to get into our country and pretend to be somebody else or get government benefits under a different ID or just have a different ID. 
Um, and this is a very valuable and, and scary part of what children's information can be used for. Additionally, schools can be a large, a, a soft target in a way to get to a larger, more sophisticated target, such as a local government or some of your vendors. Um, for example, if you have a government account or you have to work with your larger school board and they trust your district giving you certain permissions to get into their system, they can get through your district to get to the larger board who may have better cybersecurity controls. Also, as the corporate world has gotten better with its cybersecurity controls and now has more options to respond to and stop cybercrime, we're seeing more creative criminals who are now employing new and more troubling methods to complete their crimes, especially in the ransomware space. So what essentially has been happening is ransomware has been being shut down. We've either gotten keys for it, and I'm going to talk about what ransomware is in a minute. We've either gotten keys for it, or we have backups and we don't need to pay the ransom, or we can get we can stop the ransom before it takes over our whole system. So some cyber criminals have been doing a secondary ransom where they either exfiltrate data and then threaten to release that data on the company, getting them in trouble with regulatory authorities and potentially litigation their clients and customers. Or in some instances, they've actually been going after the C-suite and personally threatening them with either personal information or some other type of threat to make them pay the ransom. So imagine you have a CEO of a company and his child or her child goes to your school. That could be another way to go after the CEO or C-suite member to get them to pay a ransom for their business. And that's really something very important to think about. Additionally, virtual kidnappings have happened, and especially to affluent families. I've heard of them myself, and I've heard of certain situations personally that are very troubling. Um, essentially, what the virtual kidnappings were doing, and it is a harder crime to perpetrate, ransomware is much easier, but they would essentially spoof the child's phone, convince the parent that the child has been kidnapped, taken, or is in harm's way, and keep that parent on the phone until a ransom is paid. These things have happened in real life, and they are realities that we should be aware of, especially when you have all of these children's information. Additionally, it's not just the information that you keep on your students. A school keeps a wealth of information beyond student data. Think about your employees, board members, and administrator data. Think about former students. I went to school and now I'm a partner at a law firm. If somebody wanted to hack my old school and get my information and use it against me, that would be a very valuable and creative way to get me to do something I don't wanna do. And also getting insensitive information about former students who are in a position of authority control. Maybe there was a troubling issue that they were a troubled child or they had psychological issues or unique health issues that nobody knows about. Schools have this information and maintain it. Um, and it's really important. And before I dive into what the type of things are, I'll just notice that we've been seeing in the news reports that there's a clear increase of cyber attacks on school districts. And we only expect it to continue. The Associated Press actually just came out with an article two weeks ago talking about a ransomware attack on a school district in Albuquerque, which required the school to file to close for five days. They called them cyber snow days to address the ransomware attack and get back onto normal. So what are these terrible things that can happen? Now, this is just a really quick hit list. There's obviously more and new ways that cyber criminals are coming up with scams all, that, all the time, but this is what we're seeing over and over again. So we always start with malware. So what's malware? It's malicious software that can cause a number of different issues on your computer screen, uh, on your problem or computer system. So that could be a key logger where they're logging everybody typing and getting your passwords to everything. Or they're just watching what you're doing and stealing data and IP information or spying on people. There's definitely bad actors out there that are just criminals and trying to get access, not necessarily stealing data, but just trying to get access to students, um, children and administrators. Ransomware, everyone's heard about ransomware. It's a big buzzword, especially in COVID era when we're dealing with everybody working remote and having so many, a much bigger attack surface. Ransomware is a type of malware that locks up your system and prevents partial or total access to servers, files, networks, or systems until a ransom is paid and those keys are provided. Now, it's really interesting because ransomware has evolved from something that cyber criminals would do and it takes a really long time to code this type of malware to actually lock up your system to what we're seeing as ransomware as a service, where cyber criminals have actually taken all the time to code this really complicated ransomware, and then they sell it to other criminals for a fee. I will sell you my ransomware um, file so that you can employ it against somebody else, and I'll take a percentage of the ransom you get. And this is happening. And ransomware criminals have gotten really sophisticated. Some of them even have customer helplines where you can call if you have trouble getting the key to open up the ransomware. And this is where we're at in the cybersecurity world. And one of the reasons why 
the, um, the White House has taken a really hard look at this and started to really put in some more serious controls around ransomware. But it's a huge issue for every business and every district and every school and every government. So it's really important that you understand how it works. Now, phishing and smishing attempts are either emails, which would be phishing, and it's not the bad fish, <laughs> um, and it's not phishing with a pole. It's literally sending an email and trying to catch a target. That's why they call it phishing or smishing, which is SMS direct messaging attempts. And smishing attempts in particular are becoming more troublesome because they're either spoofing accounts or spoofing numbers to make it look legitimate, especially in COVID era. If you signed up for some of these alerts on different um, vaccines or uh, you know case counts and stuff like that, and you're getting these rude emails, I'll click here to sign up for this latest uh, alert. Um, those are becoming much more frequent. And it's another reason why even though phone numbers seem to be not personal information, it is important to include them in that. They are, they're meant to look like they're from legitimate and friendly accounts in order to trick the receiver into downloading malware. Um, account takeovers are just as they sound. It's when somebody actually gets into someone's credentials, usually through a phishing or a smishing attempt, and then takes it over and has access to that account. It's especially troublesome if you have somebody with large access that has total access to your system, like an administrator who can get into every file and every system. Um, and then sometimes it's a lower account. And what they'll do is they'll start sending phishing, phishing emails from that lower account because it is a legitimate email address now to trick other users or other employees or, or colleagues into clicking onto and downloading that malware. Spoofing is the creation of a website, email address, or Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi is an issue, and you should be very well aware of this, that's meant to trick the user into thinking it is legitimate in order to gain access to that system. You go into Starbucks to do your presentation to a class and you use their Wi-Fi, it could be a fake one, and you could have a bad actor looking on there and collecting information the entire time you're speaking. And the same thing with website and email addresses. We've gotten better as a society in identifying these issues, but they're still really sophisticated. And it's important that if you get a weird or unique email from somebody that you haven't gotten before or it just feels off, give them a call, pick it up, find some other way to contact them and make sure it's legitimate before you open that attachment or open that email. Business email compromise is a really um, important one in that it's really hurting corporate America, but it can still happen in school districts. And it's a form of phishing or spoofing that's meant to trick a business or a school district into thinking that a legitimate vendor or business partner has sent an invoice or a request for payment in order to have the funds wired back into the bad actor's account. And this is a really hard one because it's not actually stealing the money because you're wiring it into somebody's account, but it's tricking you into wiring into the wrong account. These are really common. They are still happening all the time. And it's something for school districts to be really aware of, especially if they're not aware that it's happening. Making sure that if you get an invoice from a vendor, having some type of backup to say, is this really from you? And especially if it's changing payment instructions or changing something that you haven't done with this vendor before. And then finally, denial of service attacks. This is where bad actors intentionally attack or slow down a network by sending fake server requests to the network. They can do this to school district networks or school websites, um, and it can just cause a lot of havoc, especially if you're relying on internet and throttling all your internet for the school. So these are just some of the common attacks that we're seeing. So how, what do we do about them? How do we deal with them? Now, again, we could talk about this for a really long time um, and it really behooves schools to, to try to get some personalized attention on this because at the end of the day, the standard is really reasonableness based on your individual situation. No school district is alike. There may be overlaps in some, no two businesses are alike, and there may be overlaps in some, but really having a professional come in, not only as a legal professional like Laura and I, but also having a forensics professional and a cybersecurity professional that can come in and take a look at your security system, your segmenting and your tech stacks to see if everything is working together. Now we say this knowing that resources are limited. So today we're really trying to give you some ideas on how to start this process and get them some things going while you're allocating resources elsewhere. So where to start? Data. So everybody gets really you know, um, worried about the word cyber. So I always try to take it away and, and say it's really data. And it kind of makes everybody think, all right, I can handle this. I know what data is. I'm a school teacher. Or I'm a school administrator. I deal with data all the time. Cybersecurity is really about data security. And thinking about it in terms of your data can be a much easier way to deal with the issue. Now, I, I'm going to use this analogy that I think will apply to everybody, and especially myself and Laura, because we're lawyers and this happens to us all the time. But imagine you walk into your, your office in the morning and your desk is a mess of papers. There's papers everywhere. 
nothing is organized. All you see are notes and bills and letters from parents, notes from that meeting you had last week, an agenda for the meeting you have tomorrow, invoices from vendors, check for field trips. So maybe one of your students drew you a really pretty picture, okay? There's paper everywhere. Now, you walk into your office to do whatever your job is that day. You can't just ignore this paper. You have to deal with it. Some of it is not important. Some of it's really important. But how do you know what's what until you organize it? And that's exactly what you need to do with the data that's coming into a school district. So here, if I came into my desk in the morning and it looked like that, I would start stacking. I'd have a stack for invoices and other bills. This is important, needs to be done first. I'd have a stack for student issues. Let me see what's going on here. Maybe this can be a little bit taken care of after uh, lunch when I'm a little tired. <laughs> I have a stack for administrative stuff and I have a stack for everything else. And once you start categorizing it, then you can tackle those issues as a person on your desk in order of importance. It's exactly how you have to think about your data. It's legally organizing and securing your data based on its important its importance, legal obligations, and allocation of resources. So there's so many different ways to do this. Um, most of the clients I deal with are businesses, and we usually have a three-tiered system. Sometimes we'll label them red, yellow, green, just like a stoplight. Red is the most important. Yellow is kind of just important, but not as important as red. Green is everything else. Um, sometimes we call it crown jewel data, lock and key data, catch-all data. Um, whatever way you want to organize it that makes sense for you and your district, do it that way. I think for school districts in particular, though, because of the limitation on resources um, and especially on time and talent, it would probably make sense to do it in a two-tiered system. Crown jewel data or the red data, which is really important data, this means we have a legal obligation to secure it. We have sensitive information of students, employees, faculty, board members, whoever. We have financial information, and really the information that could really be troublesome if somebody gets access to it, and then everything else. And then that way you can really start allocating your resources to that sensitive information, making sure that the most stringent controls are employed on that, and then dealing with everything else when you can get to it. We are realistic of what you guys are dealing with. This is not your only issue on your plate. And Laura can talk about a lot because I've been seeing her go crazy this week with a lot of different issues. Um, but we're so we're trying to help you just think of how to do this on a triage and start getting this done so you get the processes in place to get this on a better footing as you go forward. So you want to analyze your data. What's being collected? Why is it being collected? I can't tell you how many times people take data just for the hell of taking data and they don't know why they need it. How is it being used? How's it being maintained and secured? Do we have a policy and plan in place for when it should be destroyed? And how do we do that securely? Everybody always forgets about the fact that when you no longer have a legal right to have the data, you're supposed to securely destroy it. Almost every state has a data disposal law, Illinois included. Not all data needs to be accessible by everyone. Not everything needs to be on the internet. If I went to your school 20 years ago and you're maintaining my data because I'm a former student, take that off the internet. <laughs> Put it on a secure drive, take it somewhere else, put it in a data bank, hire a cloud provider, get it away from my system. That does not need to be stored on an internet facing system that my current employees can access. It should be something that I need to access for a certain reason and only a few people get from it. Keep it away from the internet as far as possible. Some more questions to consider. What type of data do we collect, maintain, share, secure, and eventually need to destroy, just like we were talking about before? How do we maintain it and secure it? Where are we keeping it? Are we commingling all of the data that we don't care about with all of the really serious data we do care about? Maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. How many endpoints do we have? An endpoint is really just that. It's your computer system, your smart boards, your student devices. Maybe um, teachers are using their phones or their personal laptops or their personal tablets. Endpoints are the end of the system where information can travel. How many endpoints do we have? And does every endpoint need access to all of our data? Probably not. Um, how do we best allocate the resources to secure the most sensitive data and the data that we're legally required to secure in the most efficient way? And that's what we're gonna talk about in the laws in a few minutes. And who are we sharing this data with? This is a really big one. It's becoming a huge issue. Third-party vendor risks are a very big risk to every organization, including school districts. When you share data with them, you are still legally liable for it. Now, in the school district setting, you get a little bit more leeway because you're a public institution and really who wants to sue this school over anything? Now, I know schools get sued. I have defended them in personal injury lawsuits many years ago. I know it happens. 
Um, it has, we haven't been seeing them in this cyber and data privacy space yet. We have seen some privacy related lawsuits related to what an education record is and how to get those records, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. So how do we minimize the data that we share, especially with third-party vendors? And how do we make sure that they're securing it the way they should be and they're destroying it when they no longer need it? Also, some other things to think about. How are we handling student photos obtaining permission from parents? What are we doing to vet new student technologies? And if approved, how do we inform and obtain consent from the parents? Also, think about your buildings. With smart buildings, your fire alarms, your alarm system, any IoT threat, an internet of things is any device that's connected to the internet. Those can cause physical risk to students, teachers, administrators, faculties, anybody in your building. If those things are connected to the internet, they have a possibility of being taken over and exploited. Um, think about in the middle of the day, if a hacker wanted to cause some chaos and just put all your fire alarms on at once, all of the sprinklers come on, they think there's a seven alarm fire and nothing is going on. Those things happen. And sometimes it's just people messing around or a bored kid. Um, so just think about those things and how are we securing those things and how are we thinking about them? Um, also too, documenting incidents. Now this goes, and Laura's gonna talk about this too, what's an education record? But this is really where we've seen a lot of um, litigation come in is how are we documenting incidents between student fightings, accidents in schools, problems with faculty or other employees. There's employment law considerations to think about. There's um, accident and litigation issues to think about. And then there's also the access of information. There was actually a case where a group of middle schoolers got into a fight and his father wanted to get the video, it was on video. And he couldn't get the video without getting permission from all the other students that were involved. And then he sued to actually get that video. And at the end of the day, they said, you can get it, but you have to pay for redaction to redact out all the other faces. Obviously, I'm assuming he wanted to get the video to find out who beat up his son or his child, but it, it blazes these issues of how are we collecting things and what, how are we categorizing them and what happens if somebody wants to get them. Okay, so I'm going to go this really quickly because we're starting to, I, and again, we can talk about this for 10 years, um, but we only have an hour. So these are the policies in a cyber, secure, uh, cyber security risk framework that you should consider having. An information security policy is just that. It talks about a high level policy that will cover different security controls. And the goal is not to identify and tell everybody what we're using, but to say, hey, we're thinking about security. This is how we're securing it. And to provide an audit trail to actually show you're doing it, especially if a bad day happens. An access control policy will outline access and control issues within your system. Who gets access to this information, operating systems, controls? How can we limit access and give it to only the people that need to know? What happens if that person that has access to our whole system gets hit by a bus the next day. Who gets control over that? Where are we keeping passwords? Where are we storing these access controls? Acceptable use policy. This would be both for students and teachers and faculty. We're on, the, we're on school internet. What are we doing there? Are we allowed to see certain websites? Are we allowed to send certain emails? Um, there's legal, legal obligations with regards to schools on what information can be seen and accessed. And that should definitely be put in a policy, not only for the students, but for your teachers and employees. A change management policy is just that. A teacher decides to quit. She's going to another school district. How are we taking her access away? How are we making sure nobody has access to her account? Are we watching her, her access and controls to make sure they're closed off and not an open portal into our system? And also, are we making sure that she's not taking all our information with us to the next school and using it against us? Um, it's a little bit more of an issue in the business world, but it can still happen in schools. Third-party vendor risk management, just as we talked about before. How are we vetting our third-party vendors? How are we handling the data that we're securing with them? How are we making sure that they're going to indemnify us and make us whole if they lose that data? And especially in Illinois with SOPA, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, that's a very real issue that you need to think about if you're an Illinois school district. A data retention policy is the internal privacy policy. And it goes just through all those questions you talked about. What are we collecting? How are we maintaining it? How are we securing it? When are we deleting it? Having all of those things written out will especially help you when you're trying to fight issues of getting access or information from the school. And you can go back and say, well, it was deleted as per my data retention policy. And it's really important to sit down with an attorney and really think about what do we want to put into this data retention policy and how are we managing our data? And then um, I'm going to say the bring your own device policy, which may not be fully applicable, but I wanted to throw it in there, which talks about if somebody's using their own personal device and how you're maintaining and securing the information whether it's via container environment or some other application on their personal device. And then making sure, especially in the employment context, that there's some controls about that based on what the employee is doing on their own phone 
versus the container or application they're using for school. And then finally, the most important one is the cyber incident response plan. The cyber incident response plan, um, I could talk about for days, really goes into what happened in that bad day and what are we doing to respond to the incident. Now, it will identify the internal team. So that's your, if you have the chief information officer or chief information security officer or the IT guy, I feel like everybody has the IT guy. If he's responsible for security and maintaining it, he's involved. We're having somebody that can make really fast, high level decisions. Hey, um, principal, we're seeing right now, somebody's poking around our system and they're starting to encrypt data. It looks like a ransomware event. We need to shut down the servers. Do you have authority to do that? You need someone on this team with that authority because these decisions need to be made very quickly and you can't be waiting to get somebody on the phone to make these decisions. And then finally having either an insurance professional, a forensics provider and legal counsel. Um, and it's really a high level policy that goes over scenarios and gives a roadmap, but every scenario is different. You're not gonna get one that's dialed down step one, two, three, and four, it's not gonna happen. It's more of, okay, we have this type of incident. We generally know how they play out. Let's get it together. So with that said, I, we're going to start talking about some of the federal laws. And I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, I do want to mention here COPA. So it's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. It was enacted in 1998, became effective in 2000, and it was amended and updated in 2013. The FTC is charged with this enforcement, but states can enforce it as well. And in fact, New York has brought several COPA-related enforcement actions in the last few years. Now, the rule really applies to operators of commercial websites and online services, and it's really meant to get permission from parents if they're gonna be collecting information about children that are under 13. I mention it here because it's something you should be aware of, especially if you're using education apps or some type of third-party tech provider to making sure that they're complying with COPA and making sure that your parents understand what COPA is, but it's not something that the school districts have to worry about for their own compliance. Now, in um, last year in October, uh, President Biden signed the K-12 Cybersecurity Act of 2021 and I just put the citation up there. It actually hasn't been fully filed. That's why it says note. Um, it says it was, it was signed into law on October 8th, 2021. And it requires a study analyzing the specific cybersecurity risks facing K-12 institutions. The findings are actually due this month to be reported to Congress. And then guidelines and an online training toolkit are supposed to be developed and created within the next several months and be made available to school districts. The recommendations are going to be voluntary. And it's really meant to help prop school districts up in this regard. And with that said, I will also mention that K-12 does a lot of these services as well, too, and they're a great organization. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to talk more about um, FERPA. <laughs> yeah, so this is my little world, right? Like, you know, this is what I've been navigating. And then Anne-Marie came in and it was just, oh, these, I, I feel like I've been the victim of privacy attacks multiple times in my life now, having heard that. But, um, you know, FERPA is the, the big privacy law that we've all been operating under, right? And we're all aware of K-12 and colleges and universities are all beholden to FERPA. And it's been around for decades. And obviously technology has changed over time, which affects how we are implementing FERPA, how we're making sure that we're maintaining the confidentiality of student records. And so importantly, and what, what much of the litigation surrounding FERPA has focused on is what is the definition of an education record? And here it is, those records that are one, directly related to a student and two, maintained by an educational agency or institution or by a party acting on behalf of the agency or institution. And that's when you get into third party vendors, that's when you get into people who are designated as school officials, um, you know, people you're entering into those contracts with. And so, Records is very broad and I tell, you know, districts that I'm advising, you know, it doesn't matter what form it's maintained in, it doesn't matter whether it's honestly oral or written, it's really just confidential information, right, that we are sharing in relation to students. And so examples that we know of pretty readily are obviously special education records. Within those, there is, or is very confidential information oftentimes involving student mental health. There may be mental health evaluations. And so uh, for obvious reasons, that's highly sensitive. Disciplinary records, also sensitive. Um, documentation of attendance, student courses that have been taken, et cetera. And I note there, a record can take different forms. So again, email correspondence is considered a student record. The advice on that varies, but 
You have to be, care about your email and your server and, and protect the confidentiality of the information that's being shared via email. Um, you know, and it, it, it's also those written documents. But if you think about when FERPA and when ISRA, which we'll talk about in a second, were written, it was in relation to written documents. And I visited districts and helped clean out, I mean, not physically clean out, but actually work through some of those documents that are sitting in crates and basements and tried to figure out what are we going to do with these? Because, you know, for, for permanent records, we have to maintain those for a certain period of time. And they're just, they're papers sitting in a basement, open to flood, open to fire, right? And, and how do we make that applicable to the 20, you know, the century we're living in now? And so it's the 21st century. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Thank you for being Vanna White, Anne-Marie. And so the big part of this is consent, right? So we always talk about, you know, the records, they have to be, they're confidential unless parents consent. There are a few exceptions in the law that provide the district, district the ability to release those without consent. Um, for instance, you're allowed to release them to a school official in another district, for instance, who has, you know, a, a, an interest, like if a student's going to their, they're matriculating to high school. They're allowed to send records to the district they're matriculating to. Um, you're allowed to release to certain agencies without consent. Um, but generally, parents or eligible students, an eligible student is a student who turns 18, must provide written consent before the school or the district discloses any information from the student's records. So this is, you know, this comes into play because if our data is breached, obviously we have not gotten consent from parents prior to that information being released. And so that's a potential FERPA violation in addition to the other privacy laws that Anne-Marie mentioned. And so unlike decades ago when we were just thinking about a physical piece of paper and the implications when that was taken or when that was, you know, destroyed, we're now thinking about, you know, the online privacy rules as well as FERPA in the context of those online privacy rules. And so again, this applies, this is a federal law, so it applies to all states all school districts in the country, all public entities receiving federal funding. And then the PPRA, um, that's another federal law and it allows parents certain rights. And among them is the ability to, um, they, they can opt out of participation in certain surveys. And I know that your policies and your procedures that I've seen you know, do outline that and give parents the opportunity to, to, to explicitly um, say you don't want to participate, and districts are allowed to, they're, they're required to adopt policies to protect information and, and rights that are um, under the PPRA, so any survey information or any other information collected pursuant to um, surveys and examinations, et cetera. So that's another federal law we're looking at. Anne-Marie mentioned COPA. Yeah. And then the Illinois state laws. We'll talk a bit about, I had a really fun project when I first started practicing law where I did a 50 state survey of student record laws. And so that's where you look at, it's like a dreaded associate project, but where you look at all 50 states to see if they have a certain law. And I, I was looking to see if other states had, if they had just adopted FERPA or if they had separate state records laws. And Illinois is one of just a few states that have separate records laws. Um, generally, most states have adopted FERPA. And here in Illinois, we have the Illinois School Student Records Act. It's consistent with FERPA. There are just some variations. Like I said, other states have separate records laws that also, also have adopted FERPA, but many just adopted FERPA without their own separate um, piece. And the big thing in Israel is we have what's outlined as temporary versus permanent records. So temporary records are records that must be maintained five years after a student transfers or otherwise leaves the district. And um, permanent are 60 years after a student transfers, leaves the district. So, and, and those are laid out. Permanent records are things like the student's name, attendance information, just the basic stuff that we keep to, to, to know that that student attended our school. Temporary information would include things like special education records, um, you know, records of awards you've received, um, courses, et cetera. So we know what those are and those are very clearly defined in the regulations, 
but what about everything else, right? So if we're talking about those crown jewel records like Amory reference, temporary and permanent records are probably gonna fall in that bucket as far as you know, student information. So what, where does everything else go and how are we protecting that? Because still, even though we're not maintaining that as a temporary or permanent record, it's still confidential student information, right? Um, so we need to make sure that, that we're ensuring that that's not just you know, falling by the wayside and being subject to hackers and others who are looking to, to be malicious. Um, and so that, um, so that's always a consideration. Um, and then we have SOPA in Illinois. And so a few years ago, this was getting, I, you know, I was on a very basic level advising on this. Um, Anne-Marie would obviously give a lot more insight, but, you know, this really focused on ensuring that districts, um, you know, posted that any contracts they have with vendors online so that there was transparency um, and, and gave parents the opportunity to have control over the information that was being shared and that gave them the opportunity to review the information. They've always had that right in ISRA. So if parents want to review their student records, they can request student records and then they're provided with a copy of those. And it, currently in Illinois, that's within 10 school business days, you get a copy of those. So they can inspect them, look at them, if they want to challenge the records, they can absolutely do that. So that provision's always been in the law. But um, SOPA specifically is looking at that online information. And then it also covers what inf what's supposed to happen when there's a breach of information. And so I've always said, even before SOPA went into effect, that it's best practice. You know, I know that there are teachers who have found these amazing applications and these amazing programs online that they want to use, right? Or they get you know, they go to a conference and they hear about them or they, you know, do some research online or they're getting promos about them and they want to sign up. And you know, there have been instances where teachers have just signed up on their own, but it really is best practice. And then SOPA really requires that that be funneled through the, the tech person, whoever's in charge of this information. It can't just be teachers on their own signing up for these applications and for these programs because they're basically agreeing to give student information um, without following the process, without going through SOPA, without following the privacy laws and the, the policies of the district. And so they should not on their own in their individual capacity be being agree agreeing to whatever um, provisions are laid out in that application. And so that's something to just remind teachers about and your teams about to make sure that they are not doing that on their own to make sure they're aware of SOPA, to make sure that there is a process. And, um, you know, Anne-Marie had laid out all of those policies. I know a lot of you have AUPs. Maybe you haven't looked at them in a little while. Um, and, and, you know, we can help you prioritize which are the ones to, you know, if you're looking to start tackling this, help, help prioritize which are the ones to really focus that on first. And it doesn't have to be something that you look at all at once, but there are definitely ones that, that should be given focus. Yeah. Probably and I, I, when I first took a look at SOPA from a cyber and privacy perspective, I was really impressed actually um, in that it really adopts a lot of the privacy and cybersecurity mm -hmm. controls we're seeing running across the United States, starting in California and now coming in Colorado and Virginia. Um, and even what we're seeing in the European Union. Um, so it actually is a pretty meaty law um, for Illinois school districts to comply with. New York does have, now I'm, I'm biased, I'm from New York. New York does have a cybersecurity regulation for school districts, but it does not dial down to the level that SOPA does. Um, and I, I, we put some of the information up there that Laura can go through, but it really is important to take a look at this, especially with a legal professional um, and detail what's going through because the obligations the school districts have under SOPA are, are pretty onerous. Um, so I'll turn back to you, Laura. <laughs> or what covered information is. Yeah, yeah. So here's the definition of covered information. I've looked online at a lot of, I did kind of a survey of districts um, and, and what you guys have posted online in relation to SOPA and people have really wrapped their hands around it. And obviously this had to be posted prior to the start of the school year, but you know, covered information um, can only be collected for K through 12 school purposes and it can't be further processed in a manner that's incompatible with those purposes. So there's actually a lot of language in FERPA that addresses, you know, if we do release information for purposes of study, or if we release information to a third party vendor 
for whatever purpose, you know, it can't be re-released, right? There are a lot of um, protections surrounding that. And then this also, you know, this, this speaks to that, right? Like we, we, we have to make sure that whatever purpose to whomever we're releasing any information to is compatible with, you know, it's, it's always compatible. It's always not being re-released to another party for another purpose, like advertising or anything else, right? Like we just have to make sure that it's very pointed, the information that we're releasing um, and it's necessary. And, and, you know, we're not just sending it out to, to anybody for, for, for them to use for any, any purpose. Um, and then covered information, it's personally identifiable information or material information. Um, that's in any media or format that is not publicly available and is in any of the following. So those are the definitions. You guys can read those, um, you know, created or provided by an oper to an operator by a school student or the student's parents in the course of the student's or parents use through the operator's site, service or application, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, gathered by an operator through the operation of its site and it identifies a student, including but not limited to, this is information in the student's educational record, their first name, last name, home address. A lot of that is directory information under FERPA, um, telephone number, email address, um, and then just a total list of other information that's co considered covered information. Um, and and I'll what just we add here. Records. Well, I was just going to add here that 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 is such an expansive view of covered information that businesses don't even have this mm -hmm. level of detail. Um, and and it's actually very forward looking, especially with regards to voice recordings, biometric information and geolocation information. The students you have in your school classrooms today, one day will be our next leaders and mm -hmm. everything is coming to a biometric head. So having a recording of my voice that is now controlling my bank account or my business account when I'm an adult and actually being able to voice age that, which they can do, is a really valuable piece of information. And geolocation, obviously, for the physical safety, but this list is really expansive and it definitely goes beyond what we have in the United States for privacy controls. So I just wanted to throw that in there. No, that's interesting. Um, and then here are just some more um, you know, requirements under SOPA. So we have to implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices um, that meet or exceed industry standards. So this is regarding access, destruction, use, modification, or disclosure of information. So those policies that Anne-Marie was laying out earlier, this really speaks to that provision of SOPA. And then we also have to include a data security provision in any written agreement with a third party. So you'll be posting your written agreements with third parties, and obviously that's going to need to be in there. And so, um, you know, I would I would advise that you run those by your agreements prior to signing by somebody, um, legal counsel, um, probably. I, I don't know if there's somebody else in your you know your community who could help with that, but it's probably going to be legal counsel just to make sure that you have the appropriate information in there and that you have you, you've protected yourself from any inadvertent disclosure and, you, and, and making sure that you're um, and any inadvertent access. So, and to make sure it's co you know, up to industry standards. So the state board also is supposed to be pro provide a guidance document for schools. And I do believe that that is posted on the website. I would have to double check that. Um, and then you also are allowed to have a school privacy officer who could be the official records custodian. And you guys generally do have a official records custodian, who's the person that is charged with responding to requests for student records generally. And so that may be the same person under SOPA, um, but that has to be designated um, in, in your policy or should be, it's, it may be is what it says, but you should have that anyway as part of ISRA. And then you, it also provides for the school to request an operator delete covered information on behalf of a student. So if a student's parent requests that it be deleted, um, that can happen. School can request that it happen. And you, you know, it has to be in accordance with state law. So you could not, state or federal law. So deleting the information could not be violative of state or federal law, but otherwise um, those requests can be made. And then this is the website information. This is, so this is everything that needs to be posted and maintained. Um, and again, doing a quick look at 
some districts in the state over the past few months, it looks like you guys in large part have this up there. So explanation of the elements, list of operators, a copy of the agreement um, that can be redacted um, in accordance with the state law. So for, to you know, maintain privacy, you can do that. Um, a list of subcontractors, and then um, a description of procedures parents can take to ensure that their information is only being collected and used for K through 12 purposes. Um, and so all of that is available and sh should be posted online. And I do believe that models were released. So if you have any questions about that, just let us know. And then what okay. happens? I'll go ahead. You want to go? No, go oh, yeah. ahead. I was going to say um, for the data breaches, which is, um, you know, something that I deal with all the time. Um, it's interesting because schools don't technically have to, under state law, disclose their data breaches in the same way businesses do. But SOPA actually now brings this as an obligation uh, directly under the um, requirement for Illinois school districts. So it's a little bit different. Um, a little less onerous, but still something you have to worry about. So operators must notify the school, um, and that's your third-party vendor. So if they suffer an incident and it has a covered information, they have to let you know within 30 days. So that's something to be mindful of, especially when we're doing these contract terms, putting in our data security requirements, giving an extra level of that in within our contract. Because again, um, the, the recourse is that they are having your information, you're liable for it. What's your recourse against them? Um, so maybe having a backdoor breach of contract issue, especially with these vendors, would be something nice to have and making sure that it's included within your contracts. Um, they need to notify you within 30 days. If you receive notification from a vendor, then you have to notify the parent of the student whose information is compromised within 30 days. And that needs to be a form notification as well, too. The notification requirements include, it has to, um, it's, it's not limited, but it must include the following, date, estimated date, or estimated date range of the breach. Now that should tell you a lot about what breaches are. Sometimes you don't know the actual date of the compromise. You found out on February 15th and it could have actually happened in April of 2021. Um, this is just how these investigations work out. So they're trying to give you some flexibility here of saying, all right, we found out February 15th. We believe it happened sometime in April. This is what we're working with. A description of the covered information that was compromised or reasonably believed to have compromised in the breach. What is it? Is it their name, their address, this type of situation so that the parents can know and manage that. Information the parent may use to contact the operator and the school to inquire about the breach. Um, and that's pretty standard across the industry of having someone to call. Hey, I just got this letter from you. It says my, my child's information was compromised. What do I do? What does that mean? Having somebody available to answer that and or directing them to the operator who may have more information about it. The toll-free numbers, addresses, and websites for consumer reporting agencies. Um, and this is something that you should consider talking to your parents about in general. There are free, free provisions to lock children's credit reports and um, secure their identity until they're of age that parents can take advantage of. Um, it's actually something that I help speak to my district about uh, from other parents, co-parents, that they could do for free where you could go to the major credit reporting agencies and put a freeze on your child's account. Um, and you should be, you have to provide this information in the event of a breach. Um, the toll-free number address and website for the Federal Trade Commission. That way the parent can actually go to them directly and complain, especially if it's an operator who is maybe violating COPA or violating some other um, regulation that the FTC takes care of. And then finally, a statement that the parent maintain information from the FTC and the consumer reporting agents about fraud alerts and security freezes. So those are just the what needs to be in there. Um, of course, you can include more information, but this should be a drafted document that you do run by counsel before you send out to ensure that it's complying with all the statute's requirements. And then finally, if you have a breach, you have to, and both. So if the school suffers a breach or if a vendor suffers a breach, you have to list them all on your website. And the following information needs to be included. The number of students who was covered information was involved, date, estimated date or time, and if it's from an operator, the operator. There is a requirement that if it's under 10% of your student population was, um, was involved, that you can actually leave that part off. But um, it, because it's a, a very nuanced regulation, I would definitely check with counsel before you just decide not to post it on your website. Um, but really getting a handle on data breaches and how you're supposed to report them would be something we talked about earlier in the cyber, cyber incident response plan and making sure that you have a form ready to go, um, even though you have 30 days. Now, in the cyber world, that is really generous. Um, a lot of businesses we deal with 
have 48 hours or 72 hours to report their breaches, not to consumers, but to regulators and um, different law enforcement. Um, also considering whether or not you need to report, if you are the victim of a breach, whether or not you need to report to law enforcement and get them involved. Um, and in most situations, that answer is yes. And talking to a knowledgeable breach counsel about when to do that. Tapping your insurance policy to make sure that there's coverage and that they can manage the breach for you. These are all considerations you should be dealing with if you're the victim of a breach. Um, and with that said, um, we have literally 10 minutes left for questions. So I'm going to put the question screen up um, and see if there are any questions. Um, Cheryl, if, there's, if there aren't any, I'm sure Lauren and I can just continue um, scaring everybody basically <laughs> on these issues. Yeah, so. no, there, there is one. So I know that we talked about making this a series and potentially even creating some sample forms for, for districts and like some deliverables here. So if we, you know, if a district wants to, you know, having heard all of this and wants to start looking at beefing up their privacy protections, what's the first step? What do, what do you advise that we, that they start doing? There's so many things you can start doing, um, but again, as we talk, and, and really, you know, we understand you're, you're managing uh, um, a hornet's nest and trying to catch one bee, you know, so this is not an easy task and, and we don't expect districts to be able to flip a switch and just get everything together. And I'm sure some districts are going to be in better positions than others. The best way really is to start from your data. So we try to be really practical here at Henshaw of what does a bad day look like? And what does that bad day look like? And, and especially for schools in Illinois. Now this is really applicable to schools all over the country. If you're the victim of a breach, what does a bad day look like? So a bad day looks like my school shut down. I can't get the students in the building. I don't know whose parents picking up what. I don't know whose kids have allergies. I don't know who's sick or who's actually in school. I don't have attendance records. Did John Smith come into class today? I have no idea. I can't get access to my records and working your way backwards. Um, and actually one of the things I, I, I listed it on there, but I forgot to talk about was a business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Having those ready to go and saying, all right, let's work on the worst day that could happen and work our way backwards. Our worst day is we get access to no information. We don't know how many students are in the building. We don't know where they are in the building and we can't get them back to their parents safely. Let's work that, that way and work our way down. So let's start with the cyber incident response plan. Let's get a disaster recovery and continuity plan up and running. We're planning for these things and we're preparing them. Let's tabletop them. Okay, we would literally love to have an access control policy, but we'll deal with that on a different day. You know, so really starting from your worst day if this happens and working your way backwards. I think that's the most logical place to do it. And, and talking to, you know, knowledgeable vendors. There's a lot more vendors now that are taking this risk on. Um, again, there's a program at two o'clock that'll dial more into the cybersecurity controls. And there's lawyers that are starting to take this on. Um, calling Laura and I, hey, this is an issue we're worried about. Let's talk about it. And we can start walking you through these issues. Um, and before we get our next question, I'm just going to throw up the legal side because we are lawyers. This is not legal advice. <laughs> this is for informational purposes only. <laughs> um, our emails are there if you want to contact us. Um, and we will, when we send out the recording, be sending a one-page deliverable for everybody. Um, but with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can answer more questions if there are any. And Cheryl, are there any other questions? Or Laura, if you see some? Yes, we did have one, another one come through. Um, can you speak to the potential legal considerations of school districts paying ransomware demands and or paying for cyber, cybersecurity insurance policies that, covers the, that cover those types of payments? So the ransomware issue is a really hot topic. Um, there's a lot going on in this issue. Um, and I know um, K-12 and I are actually having a really great discussion online about this. Um, the two major issues are, is there are actually laws beyond cyber laws that make the payment of ransom illegal. There's a gray area. The gray area is I need to get my information back and I have nothing else to do. So the first issue I would say is starting from what's our bad day look like in a ransomware event and having backups. And the backups need to be maintained regularly. So you're regularly backing up your system, especially for that crown jewel data, whatever that most important data is. We have backups of it. It is housed away from our system separately, either offline or on a separate online cloud provider that only certain people can access and is not directly connected to our system. So if we have a ransomware event, they can tunnel their way in to actually encrypt our backups as well too, which is actually happening a lot in different industries. Um, so that's the first thing, planning for it. All right, you've locked my ransomware up. You, you tied my school up. You know what? I don't have to pay the ransom. I have backups. I'm just going to delete this stuff, get you off, and I'm going to start new. Scratch, okay? First thing, that gives you an option to not pay. If you 
or not have that option, which a lot of businesses and companies and school districts don't have, call the FBI. Get counsel on the phone. If you have cyber insurance, get them on the phone and start remediating this ASAP. The FBI actually has keys to a lot of these more common ransomwares. And the ones that are coming out now, they're developing keys or trying to get them for. So the, the FBI is a really great place to start, especially if you're a school district, because you are a public entity. Get them and, and find out if there's a way to avoid it. Maybe the FBI can give you a key or maybe they can handle it for you. Now, if you are in a position where you really have to pay, you have no choice. Hopefully you have insurance to cover it. That might not be an option in the very near future. The major problem with ransomware payments, again, from the payment of paying ransom is technically illegal on many different issues, is that now there's a problem with the OFAC um, FinCEN list. So um, it, it gets a little more complicated than school districts, but essentially we have anti-money laundering laws in the United States that are meant to prevent money laundering. Cryptocurrency showed a, a really big gap in that, in that cryptocurrency could be used in these crimes and be paid by criminals, and they can then launder through our system legally to get American dollars. The United States government is cracking down on that, and they realized that in the ransomware situations in particular, this was happening a lot, where people were getting paid in cryptocurrency then funneling the money through some other less AML, AML districts, or even in some, you know, some banks that didn't have cryptocurrency on their radar, and turning that into clean money on the other side. So the OFAC, um, FinCEN, and, and the Office of Foreign Assets and Control put out an uh, advisory in 2020, essentially saying, we know this is going on. And if you are paying the ransom and you're doing it to somebody on the OFAC control list, so someone you shouldn't be doing business with, you will be liable for that payment, whether you do it directly or indirectly. That put a really lot, a lot of pressure on insurance companies that were helping to cover these types of issues. So whether or not the ransomware payment will be covered in the near future is a big question. There's also a few laws pending that I have to thank um, Doug Levin for because he tipped me off on this. Um, and one of them is actually in New York that will make the payment of a ransom in a ransomware situation illegal for the business or school that's doing it and anyone doing it on your behalf, which will directly outlaw the payment of ransomware in a, in a cyber insurance situation. So it's something to definitely be mindful of. It's not going away. And I would say that this year is going to be a really big year to find out where the legal chips fall on that. And Anne-Marie, so if districts, what should districts, and this is state specific probably, but what should they be looking for in insurance coverage in relation to cybersecurity generally or data privacy generally? So, and that's a great question, Laura. And Laura and I are actually going to be setting up another program um, with mm -hmm. an insurance broker where we're going to talk about cyber insurance directly for school districts. Um, mm -hmm. But really you want some basics. You want first party coverage. First party coverage is my losses. I had an incident happen. It cost me money to, to repair my system. It cost me money to rebuild the data. I had to buy a new computer. It burnt out my hardware. Maybe an IoT device got destroyed. Whatever the actual damage to you is, um, including responding. I had to pay a lawyer to put this response on my website. I had to send out notifications to student parents. I had to deal with student parents. <laughs> Whatever those costs are, you want them covered in first party coverage. Then you want third party coverage. All of my students' information was taken and now they're suing me. Are you gonna cover me for those lawsuits? Are you gonna cover me to make those people whole? If I have to pay for credit monitoring or, or create a website or a toll free number to deal with these issues, am I getting covered for that? Um, and then finally, the third one would be ransomware. But again, as we were just discussing, unfortunately, it's a change in coverage right now. Um, we're just really not sure what it's going to look like um, in the very near future. And it's just something to, to be mindful of. And Cheryl, I know we have one minute left. I don't know if there's any other questions that we can give um, that we can answer really quick um, if, you, if you have any others. And if not, we'll, we'll end it there. <laughs> uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Okay, great. Well, I hope this was informative for everybody. Um, please reach out if there's any questions um, or any follow-up issues. Again, we will be sending out a one-page hit sheet on some of the topics we covered today. And of course, Laura and I are available via email um, for any further follow-up. And thank you so much. And again, if you want more information at two o'clock, um, there is a link on the chat to K-12's program that will go more into detail on the cybersecurity controls. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Bye, thank you.